storms in me I anchor my gaze on you Father you're all I need the center of my being though there be storms in me I anchor my gaze on you I Hey friends, Fifi here. So exciting to be at our Every Nation Rain Sick online service. Now, if you're visiting with us, perhaps you chanced upon this link or someone directed you our way, we really want to say that you're welcome and we want to connect with you. We hope this is not just a passing glance, but that you will connect with us more deeply. To the old faithful, perhaps you're in your lounge watching this or you've gone to a park somewhere, what a delight to be with you this morning. It's really great to connect. So, by the way, if you are new, you'll notice below this video a link called our Connect With Us link. And the idea is that because we want to connect with you, if you follow that link, it'll direct you via WhatsApp to connect with one of our leaders. And uh, you can actually find out more about what we stand for as a church, how we do things and we can find out more about you. So please do connect with us more. We would love to find out more about you. So I've just got a, a few announcements, particularly exciting announcements today. The first one is this. With our um, Breathe series, we really just felt that it was important to create spaces for us as a family to connect more with the Holy Spirit and ex experience His power and presence in our lives more. And also that there are people we know who need a, a connection with the Holy Spirit. And so a space where you can invite your friends and family and, and other people too. And so we've got three initiatives that we are doing. The first one is called Revival Nights. We've called it Revival Nights and they'll be happening on Sunday the 7th, the 14th and the 21st of March at 5 p.m. on a Sunday evening and it'll be happening here on this YouTube channel. Um, and the, the heart behind Revival Nights is that we'll be sharing testimonies, we'll be sharing prophecies, we'll, be sh we'll also be praying for healing. So it's going to be a, a Holy Spirit soaked evening. So you don't want to miss that. Secondly, we're going to have what we call prophetic nights. Now, these will be happening on Thursday the 25th of February and the 11th of March. And the idea of the prophetic nights is that we would love to trust God for prophetic words for people who come on the, the, the feed. So it's going to be on Facebook Live and YouTube. And so if you're really, if you're trusting for a word from God, that is one of the places you can come along and we'll trust with you for a prophetic word. That's going to be super exciting. And the third one is our healing rooms. Now, our healing rooms will be happening at 10 a.m. on Zoom after our Sunday service. And the link will be shared on the Sunday service during the service. So We'll be praying for people, just like it's, it sounds, healing rooms. We'll be praying for people who need healing and we'll be trusting for the healing. So if you need healing, that's a space for you. So with all these various initiatives, we really trust that you will find a space that will really facilitate connection between the Holy Spirit and yourself. I know it's a lot of information I've just shared. Um, so... Do keep an eye on our social media. We'll be announcing 
all of these initiatives and our newsletter will also provide all that information. So keep an eye out for that. Secondly, very excitingly, if you are in a relationship that is either, either you're engaged or your relationship is serious and you, you suspect that it's heading towards marriage, we're having our premarital uh, course and this is for you. So very excitingly, some of the things that we're going to be sharing in this premarital course are God's pattern for marriage, roles and responsibilities of husbands and wives, um, communication, conflict, boundaries, finance, and intimacy. So you don't want to miss that. It's going to be six sessions, and they're going to be happening on Zoom. The dates are the 28th of February. That's the first one. All the way till Sunday, the 18th of April happening between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. It's going to be 400 rand. So if you are in that stage, please, please invest in your relationship and attend that. Friends, you know, we've been speaking and we will be speaking more and more about the Holy Spirit in this series. And one thing I want to highlight is often in the Bible, you will see the Holy Spirit associated with giving. That's an interesting thing, isn't it? But you see, the Holy Spirit is concerned about the mission of Jesus and he's concerned about those who have less. And so along those lines, I really want to encourage you to give tithes, offerings, and trust us in this season that we as a church will be more generous in this season as we experience more of the Holy Spirit. So please do give. So we're going to shift gears now and we are going to enter a time of worship. So prepare your hearts. Let's worship like we're in a congregation of thousands. Um, and after worship, I'm going to hand over to the amazing Carol Gosman, who's going to share our next instant of the Breathe series. Come on, let's go. <laughs> so exciting.
wall you can't break through, no mountain you can't move, all things are possible. There's no broken body you can raise, no soul that you can't save, all things are possible. from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets, so says the nice and creed. There is one God, three in one, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. There is one Lord of all, the Father is Lord, Jesus is Lord, and the Holy Spirit is Lord. As we worship the Father and the Son, so we worship the Spirit. Holy Spirit is not a force, an atmosphere, an influence, as some have thought. He is the third person of the Trinity, co-equal with the Father and the Son, present and causative in creation, salvation, sanctification, and resurrection. That is, all the things we think of God doing, Holy Spirit does. He is eternal, uncreated, omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. In short, He is God. He proceeds from the Father and the Son in order to uphold all things and to empower us for the works of His kingdom. He was called the Paracletus by Jesus, that is, He is our comforter, teacher, advocate and friend. We encounter Jesus and know the Father through the Holy Spirit. The word spirit can be translated into breath or wind. He is the breath of God that has breathed into mankind that we would become living beings. He is the mighty rushing wind of Pentecost that birthed the church with tongues of fire and miraculous power. We breathe because Welcome to Every Nation Ramsuk, where we see lives, communities, and society transformed through discipleship in the word, the presence, and the power of God. We are in the middle of a series called Breathe, which is about the Holy Spirit. You'll remember last week we talked about the Holy Spirit as creator. We talked about how the Holy Spirit hovers over creation to speak to the formless and void places of our life and bring order and beauty and structure and purpose. How he breathes into the dead places of our life to bring about life. He is, in fact, the giver of life. We saw how he did this at the original creation and, and how mankind kind of lost sight of God and fell away from God and the Spirit of God that had breathed into mankind breathed out. And we were left to live life on this earth without the help of, help of God, not because, not because he was mean, but because we had chosen to be the makers of our own destiny. And then we learned how through Jesus Christ and the, His work on the cross, the Holy Spirit was returned to us and how He breathed back into our lives as we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. His presence comes in and restores us to a whole and true relationship with God that we become fully human, fully what we were meant to be by the power of the Spirit. Some time back, I had this most profound experience. I was newly saved and I went to this particular meeting. Our pastor had said he wanted us to experience more of the Spirit. And we were sitting there and there was this famous international preacher who stood up and he stood up on stage and he said, I believe the Holy Spirit wants to come and touch some people. And he swept his arm across the auditorium in my direction or in the direction of where all of me and my friends were sitting, swept his arm across in a mighty sweep. And I, me standing there not suspecting anything, felt this wave of liquid love just hit me. I fell to the ground behind me and whether it was because everyone else was falling around me or just because of the power of, of God around me, but I found myself on the floor and I found myself just experiencing this this moment of God's presence with me, it felt, if I want to describe the feeling, it felt like being held in the arms of love and being rocked backwards and forwards in a comforting motion. And it's almost like the experience said to my soul, you're safe, everything's gonna be okay. 
I'm with you, I'm strong and I am able. It was such an incredible experience. And I thought to myself, how can I live in this kind of experience? The pastor at the time explained to us that this was the anointing of the Spirit of God. I want to talk to you about that today. I want to talk to you about the anointing, the Holy Spirit as the one who anoints us. I had another experience. I was with another visiting pastor who came over from the US and we were taking him out to dinner. And as we passed a table of some young people at this particular restaurant we were at, he stopped immediately and he went over to them and he said, hey, one of you has a sore back. And one of the young people at the table stood up and said, yes, that's me. He said, yes, I know this. And I also know that, that God wants to set you free from this pain. And he prayed for him and immediately the back pain went. And then he began interfacing with them. He, he felt like that they were in fact involved in drugs. He said, hey guys, do any of you experiment with drugs? Immediately they all laughed and said, of course we do. That's who we are. That's what we do. And he said to them, I, I'm going to tell you something. I am going to... Um, offer you something better than drugs. Their all, eyes were completely wide and he said, can I pray for you? And he prayed and he asked for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to come upon them. The anointing of the Holy Spirit did come upon them. They, they had that same experience as me. Just You could see they were experiencing the love of God. Their eyes got wise. Some of them just started laughing in joy from the experience. Some of them started weeping and just saying, oh, I've I wish I'd experienced this before. This is just ministering to my heart. He ended up leading all of them to the Lord and they, they came and were a part of the church that I was part of at that time. And it was just such a glorious experience. And when I watched the Holy Spirit move like that, the anointing to get things done, the capacity to do what we could not do in our own strength, I was just so amazed. And I said, this is something that I need. I want to pick up our story. I'm going to tell you a story, pick up a story about Peter and the Apostle Peter. And he, he was a good Jewish man. He did the things that God had told the Jews to do. He lived in a good Jewish way. Part of that was to not associate with Gentiles. The story in Acts 10 goes that he had this experience with God that told him that he was supposed to go and preach the gospel to the Gentiles. He was overcome, but yes, he thought he would obey God. He comes to this group of Gentiles who were in the house of a man called Cornelius, and he begins to speak to them about Jesus. And while he's speaking, the power of God falls and they are all baptized in the Holy Spirit. He realized from that moment that that this gospel was not just for the Jews, but the gospel was for every nation. But as he's preaching to these Jewish people, or these non-Jewish people, should I say rather, while he's preaching to these non-Jewish people, he makes some amazing statements about Jesus. And I want to read them to you. They are from Acts 10, from verse 34. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourself know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning with Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. As, and we are witnesses of all that he did both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. This is the thing that... The, or the statements or the speech that started the moving of the Holy Spirit amongst them. And it was a proclamation of how Jesus Christ came into the world to set things right. Jesus Christ came anointed with the Holy Spirit to remove darkness, to remove evil, to remove sickness, and to establish this good order, this great way of living, this, this perfect creation that God had meant right from the beginning. So what is the anointing? What was that thing that Jesus carried that made such a difference? What was that thing that Jesus carried that allowed him to set things right, to put things in order? What is 
the anointing. What is this anointing that the Holy Spirit brings to us? Well, we, the concept of anointing is not new to the New Testament. We see right from the Old Testament that this word anointing is used. And when we see it used in the Old Testament, it is used when kings were set in place, when kings were ordained, when kings were put in office. We see it also used when priests were ordained or priests were put in office. And then we see it used of the whole nation of Israel as a holy nation. The anointing of God seems to follow three kinds of scenarios. The Holy Spirit anoints us as kings, when anoints people as kings. He anoints people as priests and he anoints communities that are holy. So I want to talk through all of those things because it will give a clue as to how we can be part of that anointing or use or be, be endued or covered or clothed with that same anointing that Jesus Christ was anointed with. Interestingly enough, when we see Jesus anointed with this power that enabled him to, to set people free and to push back the powers of darkness, we also see him giving us an instruction. And this instruction he gave us went like this. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. In other words, there was an expectation on Jesus that the anointing that he carried, we would also carry. That the work he did, we would continue. And so when we, when we examine this concept of anointing, it's more than just an intellectual discussion. It's really us deciding how, or learning, should I say rather, how we can walk in the footsteps of Jesus with the anointing that he carried. What a great privilege. How amazing it is that Jesus made a way that the same power that he carried, we are able to carry also. The same anointing, the same ability to get things done is the ability that we can carry. Literally, when you break down the concept of anointing, it literally means the power or the ability to get a task done. Kings were anointed for something and priests were anointed for something. And the nation of Israel was called out to be holy for a reason. We're going to examine those and we're going to find that as we understand the reason that the anointing then comes on to us as we choose that path. Hold on as we examine these points. First of all, let's look at kings in the Old Testament. So the first two kings of Israel were Saul and David. King Saul didn't work out so well. King David worked out a lot better. But when Saul was made king, he was anointed with oil that means oil was poured over his head by a prophet by the name of Samuel. God told Samuel to go and find Saul and anoint him. Saul was out searching for his father's donkeys. He wasn't really looking to be king. And he came across Samuel. The two of them had an interaction. And we'll pick it up in 1 Samuel 10. We're going to read verse 1 and verse 6 and verse 10. Verse 1 says this, Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him and said, Has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over his people Israel? Has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over his people Israel? God chose him, anointed him with oil and said, I'm setting you aside for this task. Samuel begins to talk to him and tell him some things that will come. And he says that he will come across a group of prophets. And he says, verse 6, Then when you come across this group of, group of prophets, then the Spirit of the Lord will rush upon you and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. Here we see God calling Saul, who's really not looking to be a king at all, calling him to be king and then saying, I need you to do this job. But I will anoint you as, as this oil is pouring over you. So my spirit is going to pour over you and enable you to do what you could not do before. It's going to change you into a different person. 
I don't know how you feel, but there are many times in my life I feel like I just need to be a different person, that what I have is not enough for the task. But as the anointing and the presence of God comes on me, I find myself doing things that I could not do before. I find myself enabled and empowered in a way that reveals God with me. It doesn't reveal me necessarily as a great person, but reveals that God is with me and is with my mission. Spectacularly, in verse 10, we see the fulfillment of this. And it says, when they came to Gibeah, Gibeah, behold, a group of prophets met him and the spirit of God rushed upon him and he prophesied among them. I love that. It's, it's not like the spirit of God just kind of trickled over him. It's not like the spirit of God just kind of said, oh, OK, I'll, I'll do this. It's the spirit of God rushed on Saul. It's like there's an eagerness on the part of the spirit to be with us. So there is an eagerness in the heart of God to empower us. There's a, there's a rushing to be with us. Do you remember when you were a child and your parents asked you to do something? Do you remember the joy on their face when you obeyed them? Do you remember how when you started doing that thing, there was almost a rush of affection toward you? It's the same thing with the Holy Spirit. It's that when, when we obey what he's asking, there is a rushing of his presence to be with us. There's a rushing of his, his power and anointing towards us to bring about, to help, to help us in the task, to cause it to come to pass. We have another story about David and when he was anointed king. He was anointed king by the same prophet, Samuel. And he had, Samuel had come to the family of David and he had gone through all the sons and found none of them were the king. And David wasn't even around King David. He was kind of out in the fields. And finally, Samuel said, well, look, there's none of these are meant to be king. Don't you have another son? And they finally brought David in. So clearly he wasn't looking to be king either. They brought him in and we catch the story in 1 Samuel chapter 16 from verse 12. And he sent and brought him in, David. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose and went to Ramah. Samuel went and left. The point I want you to see is that that kings were anointed with oil, but after they were anointed with oil, they were anointed with the Spirit. The Spirit rushed upon them. The kings of e Israel were not, just, not, were not just chosen by men. They were chosen by God, and then they were empowered by God to lead. So what were these kings of Israel empowered to do? What was their leadership meant to be before God? Well, in contrast to the neighboring nations, they weren't called to lord it over the others, to have magnificent palaces. From the beginning of time, we see a pattern in scripture, and that is all leaders, all rulers, all kings are meant to be servant leaders. And this was very true of the kings of Israel. The instructions that were given to them were these. First of all, in Deuteronomy 17, they were instructed that after they took office, they were to write out the law of God word for word, the entire law, all five books. That's a lot of writing by hand. And then they were instructed every day to read a portion of that law so that it would be stuck in their hearts. The other thing they were instructed to do, another thing they were instructed to do, they were to judge the people in righteousness and the afflicted ones with justice. They were to deliver the needy and take pity on the weak. So says Psalm 72. In other words, they were to deliver justice for the weak, for the vulnerable, for those who couldn't care for themselves. Proverbs 31 tells us that the kings of Israel were to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves and stand up for the rights of all who were destitute. Jeremiah 22 verse 3 tells us, Do what is right, speaking to the kings. Do what is just and right. Rescue from the hand of the oppressor, the one who has been robbed. Do no wrong or violence to the foreigner, the fatherless or the widow. And do not shed innocent blood. In short, 
The kings of Israel were anointed to do justice. They were anointed to bring the justice and the righteousness of God into that environment. One of the primary assignments of Jesus through the cross was to bring justice to the world. And one of the primary assignments that he gives to his church is to bring justice into the world. Justice, biblical justice, looks like setting things right. It means surveying the world around you, noticing how that differs from God's original plan, noticing how that differs from God's dream for the world, what God would like there, what God would expect there, what, what is in God's presence, what is in heaven, if you like. And to say, where the difference is, my job is to bring a change. My job is to bring the anointing and the presence of God to see that thing gone. Why do you think, why do you think Jesus healed the sick? Why do you think Jesus delivered the oppressed? He was doing the work of justice. What was he doing? He was saying, this thing is not right. This thing is not in my father's plan for the earth. This thing doesn't sit right with the heart of my heavenly father. This thing must go. Why do you think Jesus spoke to the lonely and the outcast? Why? Because he was doing justice. He was being a king in the kingdom of his father. He was doing justice. He was being a servant king, going down to the lonely and speaking for the oppressed, delivering those who couldn't deliver themselves, helping the poor and the destitute and those who were marginalized by society. Why do you think he went for the woman caught in adultery and, and went after her? Why do you think he went for those that society had turned their back on the tax collectors, the lonely, the oppressed. Why did he do that? Why? Because he was a king in his father's house doing justice. He was anointed by the Holy Spirit for this very thing. When we are commanded to continue the mission that he began, this is what falls squarely on our laps to do justice. And what that means, it means that we look at the poor of our society and we say, this should not be. And that we, we step into the breach, we step into the gap where justice does not exist and we bring the presence and the righteousness and the truth of God so that that gap is filled. We look at the sick, the oppressed, and we say, this should not be, this is not how my father's work, house works. This is not how things work in the, in the house, in the palace, in the kingdom of our king. And we walk into that situation and where there is a gap, we fill it with the power and anointing of God. And we say to the sick, be healed. We, we reach out to the oppressed and say, be delivered. We speak to the lonely and those who are battling with mental illness. And we say, be right, be whole, be full. We do justice. This is what it means to be a king in the household of God. As mankind has been given dominion over the earth, there is a servant kingship that rests on God's people. This rulership that was lost by mankind through the fall is restored as we come to Jesus. And, and that, that kingship that he carried becomes our identity. As he is the for, firstborn over many brethren, he opens a way for us to take up that dominion mandate, to take up that rulership, to take up that capacity to rule in our situations and as servant kings and queens to bring justice, to do justice. Revelations 5 verse 10 says this, speaking of us, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on earth. When we accept the assignment of servant kings to do justice in this earth, the spirit rushes on us to anoint us, to set things right, both natural and spiritual, to set things right as they should be. You want to see the anointing of God? Step into that role. Take up your role as a, as a, 
as royalty in the kingdom of God, not to lord it over someone, but to walk into the broken places of this earth and set them right. To bring the anointing, the authority of the kingdom of God with you as the Holy Spirit clothes you in a mantle of royalty, in a mantle of majesty that sets things right. When I think of this kind of anointing, this kingly anointing that the church and you and I are meant to carry, I think of how kings are robed in magnificent garments. And I think of, I think of it as I'm walking into a situation that the Holy Spirit robes me in majesty. And as I step into that place, I bring the majesty and the dignity of, of the kingdom into a place that it wasn't there before, into the hearts of the destitute, into the hearts of the lonely, into the hearts of the broken, into the hearts of the sick. The, the wholeness and the majesty of the kingdom comes as I step in there. And my, my task is to take the hand of the broken and say, come up here, come up here into the dignity of the kingdom, come up here into the wholeness of the kingdom, is to put things in place that set things right. So those were the kings. How about the priests? The priests were also anointed. The priests were anointed for a different task. Kings were anointed to do justice. Priests were anointed to facilitate a relationship between God and people. I'm not sure if you've heard the stories of the Old Testament of what the priests did. But they, they basically received the sacrifices of the people, the, the offerings of the people, and they facilitated a sacrifice so that, so that the way could be paved for a relationship between those people and God. They facilitated the sin offerings, the worship offerings. They, they created an environment, they serviced an environment in which mankind and God could meet, where there could be relationship between God and man. That was almost their sole purpose, was to hear from God and, and deliver that message to the people, but also to allow the people to come in to the place where God's presence dwelled and to allow them to help them make the sacrifices and the, and the various offerings that they had to make so that they, they would be acceptable and pleasing to God's presence. Interestingly enough, Jesus in Hebrews is called the high priest. In other words, he, he was the ultimate priest. The priests of the Old Testament made these sacrifices, performed these sacrifices. They received the animals from the people and then sacrificed them and performed these sacrifices daily. Every day, new sacrifices were going up before the Lord. Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 7, I'm going to read it to you from verse 26. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest talking about Jesus. Holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily. First for his own sins and then for those of the people. Since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. In other words, these sacrifices of the Old Testament were imperfect. They, they didn't have longevity. It's like they had to be, keep being made again and again and again. Jesus' sacrifice was very different. Jesus came as high priest and as a sacrifice. He offered himself as the eternal sacrifice to provide an environment where mankind and God could meet, to, to clear a sacred space, so to speak, to cleanse an area where we can step into that place and we can immediately meet our Heavenly Father. His sacrifice made a way for us to have permanent, unrestricted access to the presence of our Heavenly Father. He was the ultimate priest and He was the ultimate sacrifice. However, as we had said earlier that as the Father sent him, so the Father is sending us, there's a way by which we have a mini priest role right after Jesus. Jesus is the great high priest. No one will ever do what he did. He made the ultimate sacrifice that, that will never have to be made again, that permanently, permanently, excuse me, creates a place where we can have access to our heavenly father. 
but we come after Jesus. And what we do is that we, we come telling the message that there is a place where we can meet our Heavenly Father. There is a place where we can have unrestricted access to our Heavenly Father. And that is in Christ. That is in Christ. We as many priests carry the message of His great sacrifice into the world and thereby facilitate a meeting between God and man. And when we step into that role, that same anointing that rested on Jesus Christ comes to rest on us. And we carry an anointing. It means that you will be speaking to your friends and you'll be witnessing of what Jesus has done in your life. You will find words coming to you. You will find power coming to you. you You'll find ability coming to you that you never had before. Why? Because you're anointed for the task of bringing the message to the people in this world that Jesus has made a way. As we accept the assignment of priests to facilitate relationship between mankind and God, the Spirit rushes in to anoint us with miraculous ability that confirms the message that we carry. Mark 16 verse 20 says this, And they went out and preached everywhere. While the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. When I was with that gentleman in that restaurant with those healed backs and those words of knowledge about them being on drugs and the power of the Spirit coming upon them to set them free, that is this. That, that was him acting as a priest, accommodating or, or creating an environment, should I say rather, where they could meet with God and the anointing of the Holy Spirit came upon him to facilitate that. As we go to make disciples of all nations, the Spirit rushes in to empower us. The Spirit anoints us as royal priests to facilitate relationship between God and man. Last of all, we are a holy people. The reason I want to emphasize this is that often we think that our witness is just about us, but really we are in a community. We're in a community, a body of Christ, and the witness and the light that shines into the world comes from the love that is within us, between us, amongst us. Israel was meant to, the ancient nation of Israel was meant to be a chosen nation. And this nation was meant to live out the precepts of God. Holy, holy means to be separated and different. They were meant to be separated from the nations around them and different from the nations around them in a way that they were able to be a model of what a godly community is. And the beauty of that, the majesty of that, the presence of God amongst them was meant to shine as a light before the nations that would call all the nations to come to that glory and say, what you have, this model of living, this way of being together is something we want because we want that light, that life, that blessing, that beauty in our communities also. Matthew 5 verse 14 and 16 says this about us. He said, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your father who is in heaven. There is a way by which we live with each other that's holy, that's different, that's set apart from the people around us, that causes the light and the anointing of His presence to be on us, that shines as a beacon to the communities around us and says to them, if you want this kind of beauty, you can have it. Come and find out how. John 13, 34 and 35 says this, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Can you see what Jesus is saying? He's saying, live like this. There will be anointing that will come upon you and it will prove to the world that you are my disciples and it will draw them to the light of my truth and the knowledge of me. When we accept Jesus' assignment to love one another, as Christ has loved us, the Holy Spirit rushes in to create a holy community that shines its light into the world to bear witness of what Christ has done. So I want to recap on those three things. We are anointed by the Holy Spirit to be servant kings, to do justice in the world. Justice looks like setting things right, 
destroying, obliterating poverty, sickness, disease, setting things right. We are anointed by the Holy Spirit to be royal priests, to facilitate a relationship between God and man. What does that mean is that we carry a message. And as we speak that message, as we bear witness of what Christ has done, the Holy Spirit rushes in to anoint us for that task. And last of all, we are anointed by the Holy Spirit to be a holy people, a different called out people to model a way of link. Uh, sorry, to model a way of living that brings light to the nations and stands as a beacon in this broken world of what God has done. Lord, I pray for each and every person watching this. Lord God, I ask right now that your anointing would come upon them. Where you are, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. Won't you just hold your hands out like this? I'm going to ask for the anointing of God to come upon you. That's his presence to come upon you. I'm going to ask you where you are to say yes to the tasks that are, have been put before us. Yes to the task of being a servant king. Yes to the task of being a royal priest. Yes to the task of being a holy people. And as you say, yes, I'm going to ask that there would be an experience that you would have. You would feel something of that liquid love, that presence, that comfort, that power upon you. Holy Spirit, come upon each person now who said yes to these three tasks. Lord God, I ask that you would bless them with your presence, anoint them with power. Lord God, I pray you'd give them signs and wonders and miracles. I pray even now you'd confirm to their hearts, you'd confirm to their hearts that you're doing something great in their midst. You would confirm to their hearts that you have indeed called them, Lord God, that they would feel the power and the presence of God about them. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you. Have a great week. Oh